got it. Thank you, Laura. Um, yeah. So um, we're going to go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so just a little bit about the LGBTQ Center Orange County and the Elevate program. Um, so the LGBTQ Center's mission is to advocate on behalf of the Orange County lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and gender questioning individuals of the community um, by providing services that ensure their well being and positive identities. Um, we do this through our youth programs, community programs, and events, mental health and emotional wellness, trans health and wellness, um, HIV prevention and awareness, immigration services advocacy and education, which what we're doing here today, um, volunteering opportunities. And yeah, we hope to promote um, folks within this community through those ways. Um, specifically, we, um, we help, what we're a part of is the Elevate Youth Program. Um, and we want to reframe substance use as a public health issue. Um, we want to combat the detrimental impacts of the war on drugs on BIPOC and LGBTQ plus youth and young adults um, by providing trauma-informed counseling and process groups at no cost to the public. And we want to raise awareness through social media campaigns and activities and events. So if you want to get connected to those, I really encourage you to follow the center's Instagram page. It's LGBTQ. Center OC. So yeah, if you want to get connected with us, it's a great way. Um, well, let's go ahead and get in. Uh, we're going to go over to in tonight's presentation, like how trauma presents in behavior, um, common core beliefs or hot thoughts in the LGBT community. Um, once again, types of trauma like little T and big T, the effects of microaggressions, um, then we're going to go over an intervention and how to be an ally and provide some resources. Here we have a quick review of the cognitive behavioral triangle, which just says thoughts, feelings, and behaviors all interact and intersect with each other um, and kind of dictate how we interact and, and navigate our world. First, we're going to start with defining trauma. So, what is trauma? Um, we're going to be looking at this through this lens of small t traumas and big t traumas. Um, small t traumas are events that exceed our capacity to cope and cause a disruption in emotional functioning. Um, these distress the distressing events are not inherently life-threatening, but the event leaves an individual with a feeling of hopelessness and um, helplessness. Um, this could look like interpersonal conflict, so conflict within relationships, um, which could be being misgendered, for example, or um, parents not being affirming could be another one. Um, microaggressions, infidelity could be a small t trauma, um, divorce, abrupt abandonment, and financial worries or difficulties. Um, although small t traumas tend to be overlooked by the indiv individual who's experiencing um, those difficulties, they can sometimes start to stack on top of each other. And um, one thing can lead to another, almost like, for example, if someone is misgendered one day in one conversation, and let's say an hour later, they're misgendered again, um, and then the next day they're misgendered again. These small T traumas start to stack on themselves and can cause serious distress in navigating life for these individuals. Um, big T traumas are um, distinguished by its extraordinary and significant event that leaves the individual feeling powerless. Um, this event can be directly experienced or witnessed by the individual, such as a natural disaster um, sexual assault, combat, or a plane accident. These are just a couple examples. There are many more examples, but these are just a couple that we're going to highlight. Um, 
it must be stated that um, there are no quick fixes to these traumas and there's no cures for the trauma. Some individuals are successful in eradicating the impact of the traumatic memory on their lives, while others report significant improvement with their quality of life, but it still is with them. Yeah, so I'm gonna go over um, how trauma presents in behavior. Uh, trauma affects how our brains develop behavioral patterns um, and then later cognitive distortions in an attempt to cope and protect ourselves from distressing feelings. Um, we highlighted microaggressions and we're gonna go deeper into that later in the presentation. Um, microaggressions can lead to little t's and macroaggressions can lead to big t's. Um, and how our intersectional identities have a potential to, it kind of has the potential to experience multiple adverse events. Um, Hyperarousal um, is one you might see in some kiddos. Uh, it's an unpleasant sensation where a person feels hyper aware of every stimuli, aware of every tiny sound. Uh, the person is hyper vigilant, startles easily, often feels uh, irritable and angry. Um, it's difficult to concentrate. Um, this see, this sounds kind of familiar if you talk about like ADHD or those who are diagnosed with ADHD incorrectly. Um, or even conduct, dis conduct disorders, um, it could actually be a trauma, trauma response. Um, hyperarousal is a symptom, uh, are a crescendo from mild anxiety all the way up to full fledged fight or flight reactions, or a panic attack that can send somebody to the emergency room. We have intrusive recollections unpleasant thoughts related to the trauma. Sometimes there are nightmares or recurring dreams, um, flashbacks for those who are veterans or have experienced a really big B, uh, big T trauma. Um, it's, a, it's a serious form of intrusive thought that make a person feel as though they are right back in the middle of the trauma once again. Avoidance and numbing. Um, this person uh, who experiences this may avoid situations thoughts and feelings that remind them of the trauma. This can make this person's world much smaller as they avoid all traumatic cues. And this could be an avoidance of, or the fear that there might be a, a traumatic cue outside. You don't know what it is, it's just outside. Um, so you, rec you recluse, you uh, avoid all of these things, um, isolate. Um, a great deal of energy is used when trying not to think about it. Emotional affect is flattened and there may be a sense that the future is foreshortened. Avoidance takes a much different form with large T traumas. The individual tends to be more overtly and decisively engaged in actions that are classified as avoidance. For example, those folks who are also veterans may deliberately avoid phone calls for investigators, uh, bury their military uniforms, no memorabilia in the attic or avoid private spaces. Um, these are all attempts to minimize distress and reduce reminders of traumatic events or combat. Um, and they are time consuming and energy consuming. And it is opposed to the more like passive avoidance that occurs in small T traumas. One large T trauma is enough to, con is to con excuse me, one large T trauma is enough to cause severe distress and interfere with an individual's daily functioning. And this effect is intensified uh, the longer these avoidance behaviors are uh, continued. And then we have Venus from, uh, this is taken from the Trevor Project. Um, Venus is 15 years old, able-bodied, Hispanic, Latinx, trans non-binary young person. Um, I want to reinforce the importance of core beliefs and microaggressions and the effects, how the effect that they have on the mindset of the kiddos you may encounter. As we grow up, um, we receive messages from our community, um, spiritual and cultural, um, as well as, as long as the, as well as the stories and media that they produce, we internalize them. And this is our brain's way of learning vicariously so we don't have to learn everything firsthand. 
This process is meant to be helpful. For example, Venus from this slide um, grew up in maybe a more traditional conservative Hispanic home. Um, they have, may have learned that there are many different themes from their family and community and what it means to be a trans non-binary person. And then they internalized them um, as they completed their life experience and uh, their idea of what their personal identity is. Um, I'm gonna read some of these statistics. Um, less than one in third transgender and non-binary youth find their home to be gender affirming. Um, and culture affects that. 45% of LGBTQ youth seriously considered suicide in the past year, including more than half of transgender and non-binary youth. 14% of youth attempted suicide in the past year, including nearly one in five transgender and non-binary youth. 73% of LGBTQ youth reported experience, experiencing symptoms of anxiety, including more than a, a third of transgender and non-binary youth. 71% of transgender and non-binary youth reported that they have experienced discrimination based on their gender identity. 37% of transgender and non-binary youth reported they have been physically threatened or harmed because of their gender identity. And 60% per, uh, of the LGBTQ youth who wanted a mental health care in the past year were not able to get it, including nearly three in five transgender and non-binary uh, youth. And lastly, 58% of LGBTQ youth reported experiencing symptoms of depression, including nearly two thirds of transgender and non-binary youth. Um, these were all taken from the 2022 uh, Trevor Project National Survey on uh, LGBTQ youth, 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 mental, youth mental health. Yeah, we wanted to touch on where these um, internalized core beliefs come from specifically. And we're gonna be talking about homophobia and internalized homophobia. Um, homophobia is defined as a dread or fear of the LGBTQ plus community associated with prejudice and anger towards them. And that leads to discrimination in such areas of employment, housing and legal rights, and sometimes violence. Um, these can be conscious or unconscious is often influenced by those who express homophobic ideas from an early age by friends, family, society, culture. Um, this could have an influence on whether it becomes internalized and, and is it exhibited um, as lack of protective rights and discrimination. Um, and this gets internalized by the individual and this can present itself in many different ways by denying sexual orientation, um, being unable to come out to certain friends or family members, maintaining secret relationships, um, feelings of anger or resentment towards other members of the LGBTQS plus community, um, feeling uncomfortable around other LGBTQS plus community, um, and engaging in unhealthy relationships or risky behaviors such as substance abuse. Um, there's a large theme here of shame that comes from this internalized homophobia. Um, and that's internalized, like we said, and is carried with the person um, and can affect them in several different ways. Um, on this next slide, um, we're gonna be talking about internalized transphobia and transphobia. Um, a lot of these inter um, overlap with each other, but it's still worth um, seeing the different experiences of the both. Um, transphobia is defined by an irrational fear or aversion to or discrimination against transgender people. And this could look like negative attitudes and beliefs towards trans transgender folks, um, a disbelief or discounting correct pronouns or gender identity, 
derogatory language or name calling, um, bullying, abuse, and violence, instilling gender roles onto a person, barriers resulting in folks not being able to use facilities in alignment with their gender identity. Um, and this gets internalized by the individual by maybe denying feelings of gender dysphoria, um, being unable to come out to certain friends or family members, keeping their gender identity a secret from friends or family members, and feelings of anger or resentment towards other members of the Q LGBTQ2S plus community and feeling uncomfortable around other transgender people, um, engaging in unhealthy relationships or risky behaviors like we said before, and isolation, self-harm, and suicidal behaviors. Um, this all affects someone's core belief and how they see themselves and how they express themselves. Um, and yeah, it's worth noting all these different themes and this theme of shame that surrounds it. Um, on this slide, we're gonna be talking about some microaggressions and discrimination that LGBTQ plus folks face. Um, as for microaggressions, we see that they face homophobia and transphobia, like we just went over, denial of homophobia and transphobia, heterosexism, imposing those views onto LGBTQ plus folks, um, discrimination, hate crimes, um, we're seeing barriers for LGBT, LGBTQ plus folks, um, such as lack of policies to protect them from harassment, um, not allowing an individual to use the facilities in alignment of their gender, um, lack of access to affirmative care. Um, verbally, we see this in assuming someone's gender, um, intentionally misgendering someone, um, assuming the gender of an individual's partner, using someone's dead name, um, bullying, harassment, sexual harassment, and then social issues. We see this as in um, acting surprised by someone who is queer, trans, or non-binary, um, lack of representation, and assuming the sex assigned, that the sex assigned at birth is the same as their gender identity. Um, we talk about this because this starts to be internalized and starts to become those small T traumas. And like I said earlier, they start to stack and they start to get heavy and it's hard to carry. Um, and so that's when we see um, symptoms of depression arise or anxiety. Um, and it's because of these things that start to stack. Um, before we keep moving, I saw that oh. we have some uh, questions in the chat. Um, and I could this create chronic fatigue? Uh, sometimes depression can uh, mimic uh, chronic fatigue um, like symptoms. Um, PTSD definitely uh, could create chronic, chronic fatigue, especially in our kiddos. If we someone if we, if we see someone who is, always sleeping in class, um, always uh, seems tired. Um, this could be because of their living situation and because of big T traumas. Um, yes, 100%. Um, any other questions or comments before we move on? Okay, okay. If you don't have anything to say, uh, please go ahead and throw up a little bit, a little bit of hand, thumbs up. So I know it's all right to keep going. All righty then. I see a couple, I'm gonna keep going. Um, we're gonna go into how to understand and uplift marginalized communities. Um, especially within the LGBTQ two spirit plus folks, um, especially with disabilities. Um, the ADA defines a person with a disability as a person who has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activity. 
an estimated three uh, to five million LGBTQ two spirit plus folks have disabilities. Two in five are transgender adults. One in four um, LGBTQ two spirit plus adults are in California. Um, compared to the 27.2% of the general po po population. And there are some unique challenges faced, um, especially because unfortunately, not all spaces are physically accessible. Um, and we're talking about access, uh, transportation, um, we're talking about ramps, elevators, um, seating, LGBT, Q two spirit plus folks with disabilities are at an increased rate of experiencing bullying and exclusion within their own communities. Um, able-bodiedness is seen as the norm and ableism is just seen as non-existent, the typical, the normal. And they are subjugated to un an employment uh, discrimination and visibly within their own communities and they're most likely to also be harassed within their communities. Lack of recent representation of both disabled and uh, being part of uh, LGBTQ two-spirit plus identities in the media. And the assumption that people with disabilities are not sexual or can't participate in kink. Overrepresentation in the juvenile and criminal uh, justice systems. This meaning is a lot of people who are in juvenile and criminal justice systems are people who are experiencing trauma um, and are having mental health crisis or um, that presents as conduct disorders or um, not, uh, not fitting into what is a cisgendered white man's uh, world. Um, and therefore they are over-policed and represented in uh, these facilities. Oops. And why is it so important to highlight this data? Um, we have to acknowledge everybody's individual identity and how each part of their identity um, affects how they navigate our world. Um, specifically uh, with transgender and non-binary folks, um, we wanna highlight that misunderstandings are common um, with individuals relatives, loved ones, friends, their workplace and community. Oftentimes they have like a second coming out which also may not be celebrated and accepted. Um, within the LGBT community and other queer spaces, um, that does not mean that they are uh, exempt from being ostracized as being transgender and non-binary. Um, of, often they are told messages of that they are not enough are confused. Um, Non-binary folks are also, also misunderstood as being laid as in some type of transitionary period or a phase between transitioning from one binary gender to the other. Uh, trials that transgender and non-binary individuals may face include, but are not limited to, being misgendered, which of course exacerbates dysphoria discrimination and or loss of inclusive spaces, such as restrooms, other public facilities, uh, affirmative physical and mental health care services. And like we've talked about, uh, these microrogations increase with the intersectionalities of the transgender or non-binary identity. Um, we specifically also want to highlight um, BIPOC folks, black and indigenous people of color. Um, LGBTQ BIPOC folks experience microaggressions from both racist and heterosexual lenses. As a result, the majority of BIPOC students, uh, a part of a, apart from the queer and, LG, and or LGBTQ communities face an added barrier of being judged not only for their race, but for their gender expression and or sexuality. Um, these uh, statistics are taken from the GLSEN Erasure and Resilience Report from 2020. Um, for the students surveyed, uh, Latinx LGBTQ students 
over half felt unsafe at school because of their sexuality. 44.2% felt unsafe because of their specific gender expression and 22 felt targeted because of their race and ethnicity. For Asian American Pacific Islander students, 51% felt unsafe at, at school because of their sexual orientation, 41 uh, because of their gender expression and 26.4 because of their race and uh, ethnicity. For black African American LGBTQ students, 51.6 felt unsafe at school because of their sexual orientation, 40.2% because of their gender expression, and 30.6 30 because of their race or ethnicity. Native or indigenous students, 65% uh, felt unsafe because of their sexual orientation, 51 because of their gender expression, and 19.7% because their race and ethnicity. Um, just, and this is just a reminder. Um, oh wait, go ahead, Jordan. Yeah, literally the same reminder. Um, sexual orientation and gender identity are only a part of what makes up individuals. Um, to ignore the other parts of their identity, it would be ignoring the individual's entirety of their self. Um, and that's why we go into this and want to acknowledge these parts of folks. Um, we're going to pause here for questions. If anybody has any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. If not, give us a well, thumbs I have, up. I have one uh, experience of homelessness. Um, yes that very well can uh, be in and of itself a, uh, a trauma and affects how they uh, navigate their world. Um, and 100% can lead to uh, feelings of depression, anxiety. Um, and this is higher in rates, uh, especially black trans youth, um, where they are pushed out of their homes and are left on the street. Um, which increases uh, suicide, suicide ideation. I saw some uh, thumbprints anymore. What do you suggest if a dead main is used by accident? We're actually gonna go over that later in the presentation. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna put a pin in your question. Okay, I see one. All right, all right, all right. We'll keep going. Okay, this is a review from, a quick review from our last session um, of Trauma's Focus a cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, some of these overlap with each other and you may have heard references to them early in the presentation. Um, these are just examples of some themes uh, that become the core of how somebody navigates uh, their personal identity. Um, and they can be not helpful. They can be distorted and they are internalized homophobia. Um, sometimes they can also appear in the internalized transphobia. Also colorism, um, racism, um, class, all can be core beliefs that are internalized. Um, internalized homophobia, my sexuality, my sexuality is wrong. No one will like me because I am queer. I am unlovable. I am bad. My family and friends will never accept me. People will think that it's contagious. Uh, my faith, my culture will not accept it. I will catch a gay disease, um, for example, HIV AIDS. Um, some that refer to internalized transphobia, I will never pass, no one will ever love me. I will be harmed because of who I am. I will never have friends or a job. 
I hate my body and or my voice. My body will never be the right fit. My family will never accept me and I will never feel safe. While we look at these hurtful and harmful uh, beliefs, it is very important, um, as we said in the last presentation, to not to discount why someone has built these beliefs um, for survival. Um, when we're looking through the trauma-focused lens, we're seeing that these are little tra T traumas that have built on top of each other. And a person must behave in a way that they can navigate their world where they are receiving these types of information. Um, and when they come to treatment or they come seeking your help, um, you can identify these and help them no longer have to use them to survive. Um, we need to validate these beliefs um, because they come from not only messages, but they also come from realities uh, that they may not be safe. Um, in certain areas, in certain communities, um, they may not have support and they may need to remove themselves from that. Um, hot thoughts are a little bit different from core beliefs. Um, hot thoughts are, are automatic. They are more surface level, but they sometimes are unconscious. Uh, Trauma-focused CBT teaches clients to recognize and challenge these automatic hot thoughts. Automatic thoughts are what they sound like, um, thoughts that a person has automatically in response to a trigger event situation. Often these thoughts occur outside of that person's conscious awareness. One way to recognize these thoughts is by asking the question, is this irrational and is this harmful? Um, once you identify these hot thoughts, then you can work to dismantle these thoughts. Um, we're, while we're doing this, we're reminded that Trauma affects how we got to these behavioral patterns, cognitive distortions, and they are protective. Um, we must remember this uh, um, intersectionality as we continue. Um, one intervention uh, to challenge, but while validating somebody's feelings or experience is to do a thought record. Um, these are, these worksheets are found everywhere on Google. If you copy paste, copy pasted thought record, uh, many CBT uh, forms will just pop up and they're very easy to do. Um, and, you, and you can do them with pretty much anybody's, um, around anybody's age. Um, we have date and time, the situation, uh, the automatic thought, an emotion associated with the thought, an alternative thought to the automatic thought and um, the outcome. It is important to like notice when the date and time of these thoughts because it, it gets data. It could tell us that there is a mood disorder, that it's happening at a specific time, like say right when you wake up or right when you're about to go to sleep or right when you've had a heavy meal. It could mean that there's a hormonal imbalance um, or when certain chemicals or hormones are released and when certain hormones or chemicals are decreased. Um, these thoughts are how our body feels, our, affect our behaviors and our thoughts. Um, also the situation, what were you doing? Um, was it a situation re uh, related to a traumatic, traumatic event? Um, were you in a crowded, crowded space? Were you at home, har home alone? Um, this is all helpful information. What exactly were your thoughts at the time? Um, how much did you believe in the thought? It is important when you're doing this step, uh, when you're giving the rating, it's zero to 100, that sometimes it may very well feel like 100%. I feel and believe these things. Um, we don't want to discount or invalidate anybody's experience. Um, you, very well, wait, wait, you very well may feel that no one will ever love me because I am trans and no uh, non-binary. Um, Real quickly, if we could pause for a moment, we have one person who can't see the slides right now. So I wanna check okay. in, Can, are other folks able to see the slides?
on my cell is just a, a black screen that I see. I, I was hoping to check to see if, if it was just mine. Or... If you're on your cell phone, try uh, flipping screens. Sometimes they will put like all the speakers on one section and then the slide on another section. Um, you might want to check which section you're on. Still no slides. Sorry. But continue, please. I can I can see them in the recording if everyone else was able to see them. It's just my phone. Earlier it was changing sizes as well. Okay. I wonder what's going on. It might just be Zoom. Okay, let us know if you guys have any more problems. Um, I was talking about emotions. Um, so what? how did you feel at the time when you wrote down this emotion? Um, how intense uh, was the emotion? Once again, we're validating feelings. Um, and then we have alternative thoughts. Um, what evidence is there that the hot thought is true? And is there an alternative explanation? It very well may be that you have a hot thought and it feels true, but there might be something else that's going on. Maybe you're not in a supportive environment where um, people are accepting and loving and affirming. Maybe uh, you need to remove yourself and find people who are affirming. Uh, maybe this isn't how the world operates and it is just your family or the people that are around you? What, what could there be? Validating, holding that this is your reality, and what else could there be? Uh, not a but, but and. Um, and then we have an outcome. How much do you believe in the original thought now that you've thought about the alternative, um, al alternative uh, thought? And what can you do now? Once again, the first time you do this, uh, the first time you present a thought, you might be resistant and it very well may still be 100%. But the more that you record, this is just one um, section, but I believe you can get calendars, um, multiple entries points. So what can you do now? What can you do um, to support yourself to have an alternative explanation? Um, this is one way you as a clinician, a teacher, or a parent can intervene for a kiddo in the community. Um, however, Jordan will provide other ways you can be an ally in all spaces. Yeah. Um, yeah. So how to be an ally. Um, an ally refers to someone who advocates and supports a community other than their own. And so allies are not part of the communities that they do help. Um, a person should not just self-identify as an ally, but rather show that they are through action. Um, and this could look like um, using inclusive language for LGBTQ plus, so LGBTQ spirit or two spirit plus, um, which means um, not making assumptions about their name, gender identity, or sexual orientation, um, avoiding microaggressions, um, such as creating unwanted physical distance between oneself and someone a part of the LGBTQ plus community, um, using in, insulting words such as gay, stupid, bad, um, or misusing someone's pronouns or dead naming intentionally or unintentionally. Um, I know that we had a question about this one, um, which I'll get into more the next slide, but dead naming and misusing someone's pronouns um, can become a small t trauma. And on the next slide, I will um, go over how to handle those kinds of situations. Um, but also um, allies can show support by promoting ideas that homosexuality and gender identity are not bad, false, or not normal. Um, so the goal is to normalize this and we do that through the use of pronouns on your email signature, um, Zoom window, name tag, um, just to show that that this is normal. Um, we're eliminating the use of preferred to describe the name and pronoun 
Um, this is because that pronouns and names are more than preferred. Um, preferred implies that there's like wiggle room to not. Um, but for somebody who's transgender or non-binary, um, those things are as ma a matter of fact, like these are my pronouns, um, this is my name. So we're eliminating the use of preferred pronouns. Um, we're, by being an ally, listening to LGBTQ plus people's experiences um, and validating that, like we've been saying, um, confronting your own biases, um, looking into that internalized homophobia, internalized transphobia, because that can happen. Um, even if you don't identify as part of the community, these are messages that we've been hearing throughout culture, life, um, relationships with friends and family. And it's up to us to confront those things um, and, and um, do some self-work there. Um, we also can show our support through advoc advocacy at the academic, employment, and legal levels. Um, and if and when possible to use your privilege to correct someone who's misgendering, dead naming, or using non-inclusive language. So this could be um, just gently correcting someone. Oh, their, their pronouns are they, them. Um, gently um, standing up for someone who maybe is facing some discrimination um, by being an ally that way. Um, Another example is accompany, accompanying someone to the bathroom or changing facilities that are in alignment with their gender identity. Um, a lot of the time folks can feel unsafe in those spaces and unsure if there might be someone who's unwelcoming in there. Um, and if they had an ally with them or someone they could trust, it could just be that much easier to use the restroom. Um, <clears throat> just um, some tips for using inclusive language, um, some do's. So do ask folks what pronoun they use right away, um, using a person's name or they, them, um, until you can get clarification. Um, ideally, you would just ask. Um, folks are normally very receptive to that um, and would love to share. Um, adding your pronouns, like I said before, to your email or anywhere that your name's displayed. Um, excuse me. Um, this, hel this helps normalize proper pronoun use um, and normalize that people um, have different pronouns than maybe what you assume. And um, introducing yourself with your pronouns like we did tonight. Um, using gender neutral language when talking. Um, for example, hey y'all, hey all, y'all, everyone, folks, friends, colleagues, humans, beautiful people, etc. Those are just a couple examples. Um, instead of hey guys, um, guys implies obviously a gender. Um, and if someone is not identifying with that gender identity, that could be a small T trauma being lumped in with that group in a way it's being misgendered. Um, using parent, caregiver, guardian instead of um, mother and father um, because we don't know um, how someone's parents identify. For example, I have a transgender parent um, and that's inclusive language within that. Um, using sibling instead of brother or sister. Again, using that inclusive language, taking away the gender um, pressure in that way. Um, using partner or spouse when regarding someone's partner or spouse, um, gently correcting yourself when someone or yourself misgenders a person. <clears throat> and this is seen, um, we could do this by, um, quickly correcting yourself and moving on. That's it, that's it. Just quickly correcting yourself and moving on. By excessively apologizing, it creates an uncomfortable situation for the misgendered person. Um, 
and to explaining and uncomfortable situation for the person who did it because now they have to explain why they did it. It's not needed. Um, just correct yourself and move on. Um, using terms like biologically female, male versus assi assigned female and male at birth. Um, so using terms like assigned um, female at birth, assigned male at birth, um, which we see in AFAB and M or AMAB. Um, and asking a person if they, yeah, this is a don't. So don't ask a trans person if they've had sex change operations or plan to. Um, that's generally some their own business, the individuals. We wouldn't generally ask a cis person um, about their genitals. Um, yeah, that's their business, not somebody else's. Um, by asking someone what their real name is or what their birth name was. Um, again, that's their business. That's not how they choose to present themselves. That's not who they are in the room. Um, and like I said, that's their business. Um, saying things like, um, it's too much to understand, I give up. Um, in that it's saying that their identity isn't worth your time. Your, their identity isn't worth your work when it is. Um, it's just as much worth as somebody else's. Um, assuming that you know which restroom or changing facility someone uses. Again, that's up to them, not us. That's just a couple ways. Um, and right here, um, we have our LGBT. BTQIA plus using young adult support that we hear, have here at the center. Um, we have on Mondays, we have QChat, QChat in Espanol, um, Breakout, Gender Flood, PRISM, um, Advocacy Through Art Coalition, um, Queer Men's Group. We have Study with Pride, Sisisn't, or Sisisn't. Um, and we have the Rainbow Group, we have Outlet, we have um, the Elevate program at Youth Empowered to Act, we have Inbetweeners, um, South County Rainbow Group, Breaking Binaries, and Rainbow Connection. And these are just a couple of the groups that we have here at the center. We actually have a couple more that aren't included on this. So I do encourage you to um, check out our website if you are interested. It's um, lgbtqcenteroc.org. Um, or you can scan the QR code that's right here. Um, yeah, or you can email Brittany or I um, if you want more information. Um, next, we have, on the next slide, we have uh, teen and young adult support. Um, these are, uh, first we have the call, text, or chat. 988 and they will be connected to a trained counselor as part of the existing national Su suicide prevention lifeline network um, another crisis hotline uh, for quick support is transgender suicide hotline uh, the nami warm line is non-crisis support for those who are feeling lonely or just want to chat i feel like there's somebody else out there that cares the Orange County Crisis Call Center uh, connects people in need of support for mental illness, substance use, developmental disabilities, sexual assault, or those who need information or referrals with trained professionals. And this is 24 seven. You also have text for teens, um, and which is also now uh, 24 seven. And here we have our post test QR code. Go ahead and take a screenshot or um, uh, scan it if you are on your computer. And once again, this is just for our data to make sure that uh, you guys are hearing what we're saying, that we're delivering it properly, and um, we can figure out what is best to uh, support the community in our educational goals. We'll give you guys a couple seconds before we move on. Um, also, while you guys are taking this, um, 
if you have any questions. Um, we have one question. Oh yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm gonna ask, answer Sarah's and then we'll get to you, Lev. Um, Sarah asks, should I also ask preferred name along with pronouns? Um, yeah, and so like I said before, just ask, what's your name? What are your pronouns? Um, we're trying to stay away from that preferred word because it implies that there might be some wiggle room in someone's gender identity or expression. And it's, as a matter of fact, we want to look at it more through that lens. Um, Lev? Hi, I have a whole bunch of questions that I'm probably going to be emailing you guys. Um, so one of the big things that I'm encountering um, is that even with training for, let's say, service providers, healthcare providers, homeless shelter, um, educational, uh, you know, context schools and whatnot, there's training and they hear all this, but then it's like there's no accountability if they do something or they transgress or there's a mistake or they ignore things. So I, I've personally experienced, but also wit witnessed um, with youth, youth and adults, um, you know, uh, microaggressions, toxic masculinity, microaggressions type things um, that affect people that would usually be allies. Um, and I mean, I won't take time into going into details, but just very, very significant trespasses um, of the, the principles and, and the, the ideas that you've shared today. And I've always asked, well, what's going to be done about it? And it's like, well, nothing. And what usually happens is the person who's being insulted or um, put down or belittled or who is experiencing the harm of certain actions or words is usually the scapegoat who pointed out, you know, oh, well, you're being, you're antagonizing or you're doing this, you know, so I see a lot of that from people that are supposed to be allies and they're supposed to have rudimentary training. And so my question is, is there any kind of, you know, kind of checks and balances in the sense of people learning to put allies and then, you know, part of the community learning to put these principles into practice and then making sure that they're adhered to in the appropriate way? Because right now I'm not seeing that. And I'd love to hear your thoughts and experience on this. Oh, yes. Um, uh, I would love that al those who pro say that they are allies to be allies, um, to show up. And unfortunately, um, institutionally, it's just not built that way. Um, there are only, and there's only so much that you can do. You can report, uh, you can protect, and you can go above and beyond. I know, I know. But as we have learned, uh, as we grow in a space, um, whenever there is some type of increase or a push forward, there will always be a backlash. There will always be someone uh, who refuses to listen and um, refuses to um, cooperate. Um, so yes, I hear your frustration. Um, I have been in those uh, uh, principal offices and it sucks. I want to. I want to hundred percent validate that. Um, I wish there were um, some checks and balances, but we just have to keep up the good fight and um, stand up where we can. I'm sorry, that's not really an answer to your question, but uh, but uh, yeah, I wish I wish there was too. <laughs> Thank you very much. Any other questions? Hello, can everyone hear me? Mm -hmm. I have a question about um, uh, as I as a clinician who will be working in this population, um, I also live in. I've noticed that for me, I can do all the I can do the training and to be more affirmative but I also don't want to put my client in the position to be constantly having to sort of educate me is there 
I really like the um your approach, Jordan, where you said that too. It's just it's a fact. Like you say, what's your name? Uh, pronouns. That was that's very very helpful. But I do I think I'm really struggling with um just in our culture, living in the culture, and how ingrained um a lot of these uh no what I what like sort of society adopts as gender uh, norms are. So is there anything that um I can be more sort of like mindful of when approaching clients who, so that they're not just in a position of having to constantly teach me or correct me or inform me? I don't know if that question uh, makes sense. Yeah, it totally makes sense. And you kind of already have done the work. You are mm -hmm. attending a training about more information. You are ingratiating yourself with more knowledge. You are not going to absorb everything in one day. You are a human, but you're doing your best. That there is a humility uh, to your approach, that there is a sense of, I want to learn and I want to, I care for my client. You're already on the path of what you need to do. To, so continue, push forward and be uncomfortable. Yeah. Yes, I was going to say that same thing and and acknowledging it is that first step. You're here. Um, that's another step. Um, and continue to seek out that information that you want to know and get curious. Um, yeah. I hope that answered your question. Yes, thank you. And um, thank you for for validating that. Yes, it, it's totally understandable and I realize where it's coming from which is um just I think I'm just frustrated with um my own inability as a clinician because I feel that you know our clients deserve better and I think um I'm uh, it's a familiar frustration where it's it feels like very little to ask but very um but hard to do in practice you know oh, but thank you for normalizing that hundred percent, just like racism is something we all learn. Um, gender and sexuality, the rules on that are something that we have all learned. And it will take our whole lives to unlearn and um, absorb properly. Uh, Lev put a helpful link in there as well. That's so um, cool. Yeah, thanks, Lev. We'll check on that. Okay. Um, next, we have our resources here. Um, we can go ahead and move on to the, oh wait, it's not up there yet. Does anybody have any more questions though before we keep, keep going? Thumbs up if you're good. Okay, I see my thumbs up. Okay, so we have a uh, positive psychology, um, which is very helpful. Um, the Child and Welfare uh, Information Gateway, um, the LGBT map, um, the GLSN, uh, GLSEN Erasure and Resilience Reports from 2020, the APA, the American Psychological Association, the Trevor Project, um, the CARES Bex Institute, um, Therapist Aid, which is a great place to look for uh, worksheets, uh, especially with TFCBT, and Psychology Today. Um, oh, let's see, Jordan. The next slide. There we go. Um, so yeah, thank you for coming tonight. Um, if you want to contact us, here's our contact information. Um, yeah, so I'm Jordan um, Dugan at the LGBTQ Center OC, and then this is Brittany Hardin um, at the LGBTQ Center OC. Yeah, so feel free to reach out if you need anything. Re Happy to help. Oh, I have um uh, another question if you have time. Mm -hmm. We surely do. <laughs> for for me, it really helps me to um really conceptualize and understand uh sort of where the sort of where the community is now in terms of being if being an ally, then I would want to know I would want to know more about the history or where sort of um this hate and discrimination is sort of stems from. And this is the way that I sort of, I better understand things. Um, it was how I 
I researched my undergrad, just I think it would help me to uh, on a, be a better clinician. Do you have any resources or literature or something where I can familiarize myself to sort of the historical roots of where um, this the discrimination is stemming from? If that makes sense. Sure, I think we can email you that later. Um, I also I don't have any of them right now. Um, but a good place to start is uh, when you're looking up history is. Uh, Stonewall people uh, that's a good place for a lot of people who are new um, uh, and going on a deep dive Google search um, and I encourage you uh, to go in there and explore there's a big old uh, lots of history out there um, and uh, it's okay if you don't uh, know exactly where to start but yeah I could totally email you some um, more information on that later oh Lev got some cool books too Lev's coming out Thanks, Lev. This is so cool. Love that. And I'm looking through that other one you just sent. I also, I wanted to offer a piece um, from my personal experience, just again, affirming Sarah that, that even being a clinician with the awareness that there are things that I don't know uh, that I still need to figure out. <laughs> I will say from my experience that that's already putting you leaps and bounds um, in the direction of being an affirmative provider for trans folks than many people <laughs> who are supporting the community. And um, that some of the most, I would say, uh, upsetting experiences that I have had with providers is the people who are like, oh no, I know what you are. I understand. I have the information and nothing that you can tell me about your own experience is going to <laughs> influence how I am thinking about you. Um, so yeah, just affirming that that you are very much like on your way and doing the things that you need to do. Thank you. I appreciate it because um, I have done a sort of a Google dive search and there is a lot of uh, uh, garbage Maybe that's that's that that's a little too harsh, but a lot of um, people who will write as experts, but it's kind of oftentimes the literature will be written from, uh, you know, uh, like sort of the major perspective. So thank you so much for um, these resources, and please send anything else you uh, I can look at my way. Thank you. Oh, this is so funny. You think, sorry, no. <laughs> any other questions or Lev, any book recommendations you got in there? <laughs> and for folks watching the recording who won't be able to see the chat, we just got a garbage pail emoji in there. <laughs> I have a ton of different um, resources that I've put together in book recommendations, but right now I'm pecking at a cell phone with my left hand as my non-dominant hand because my, uh, my other one's broken. So I just can't do it fast enough, but I can always provide that for anyone who can just, I have a whole, really some really cool different resources that um, I vetted and, and research. If anyone, you know, anyone can get in touch with me. Anything else or any um, other questions or comments about the presentation? Yes, definitely. Alrighty then, um, thank you guys for coming and uh, we will see you on the next uh, presentation, which will be March 29th. And we'll be talking about childhood trauma and substance use. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. See you next time. Thank you. Thank you, love. Thanks for coming. <laughs>